ADAS is embarking on a new project to highlight the diversity of people and experiences of those working in social care. A number of colleagues have been interviewed to explore the many different ways people take to leadership roles and the positive impact they are making. Positive representation matters. We hope that this series will inspire all of us to stand up and shout louder about the issues that matter to us the most. I'm Brian Parrott, um, an associate member of ADAS, but um, a social worker. Um, a director of social services and then a director of adult social services. What were the biggest barriers you faced in your journey to a leadership role? I was first a social worker in 1973. I was first a director in 1995 and I ceased being a director in any proper role in 2010. The barriers that are evident to others and the barriers that are known to us privately are often two different things. The barrier is often internal, isn't it? It's our own scarred backgrounds. Uh, our own psychological barriers. Um, so on the surface, I know that I can present as male, first advantage, um, education, apparent, um, second, looking the part, which will have been very relevant in the days of male directors and male leaders of councils. The real me is the person with all of the lacking of elements of self-confidence, lack of assuredness, lack of resilience, things that most people wouldn't know and wouldn't see, but so has also a quite financially disadvantaged background. And my father died when I was young and I made my way into my career and through education very much on my own. Um, now, those things are not relevant to what other people see, but some of those elements affect me personally very directly. But more importantly, it makes me very fussed about unfairness, injustice, people being treated badly, either by the attitudes that others display or in the uh, quality of service or the lack of service response. But having said all that, the reality is that barriers for me were and are far less than the barriers for many of you rising in your careers. What does diverse leadership mean to you and why do you think it's so important? There are two elements to this, leadership and diversity. Diversity to me is about recognising and respecting difference in all of its elements. Um, and in leadership, it means expecting it and requiring it of other people and challenging it when it's appropriate. Um, I think if we're talking about inequality, we need to talk about inequality. And if we're talking about racial inequality and disadvantage, we say that, and the same in relation to gender, and that the whole concept of diversity doesn't get diffused across every conceivable protected characteristic. But it's those underpinning values accepting people as they are, not necessarily their behavior, but accepting the person, respecting the person, um, and being non-judgmental about the person and modeling those things as a leader. That's not to say we don't fail ourselves and make errors, but it's about demonstrating that those values and passions matter to you and that others hear you in that mode and hear you challenging other people. What is a simple but often overlooked change senior leaders could implement to create a welcoming and inclusive work environment? It's about it being apparent to others that you are living and doing the things you say you believe in, in relation to diversity or inequality. It needs to be being seen to challenge uh, people or behaviours in appropriate ways, but very directly when uh, people are not showing the respect, are using language that's inappropriate. The other point for me would be about showing you a person, being able to be informal, reaching out, demonstrating the empathy which you've got and can show to other people, uh, registering other people when they're talking to you and acknowledging the value of what they're saying. If people can't see who you are, and what you stand for, the rest, frankly, is lost. What piece of career advice would you offer those of us from traditionally marginalised or underrepresented backgrounds? That there are ways and means of reaching out and finding people who will support and enable your development and will respect you as a person, regardless of what role you are within a hierarchical organisation. Seek conversation and, and seek opportunities to engage with those apparently more senior than yourselves. And frankly, if an organisation rebuffs those sorts of informal opportunities to learn about and learn from, you may be in the wrong organisation where the culture is going to inhibit your growth and development. But I would sometimes just fall back on organisations are often not right for people. And an individual senior manager who's good for you 
in an organization where the underpinning culture isn't may not be the place to stay. But I see people who've been damaged, scarred by the cultures that they've been within. And I've often wondered, and people alongside me wondered, well, I can see the ability, I can see the talent, but are they damaged by what's happened to them previously? And can they move beyond it? So find the right organizations, find the right people to engage with and be willing to learn and reach out. What would you say are the biggest challenges you now face in a leadership role? The first thing is about how real um, and credible some of the interactions you're all dealing with online with people in ways that um, I never did. Of course I didn't. The second thing for me is about the nature and size of people's portfolios. Some of the uh, values and principles and practice experience that come from direct personal engagement with people in disadvantaged positions is relevant. And if you are taking on children's without a children's background or public health without a public health background, how you make up for that and how you compensate for that and how you learn about it is really very important because I think it will not look credible unless there's an honest acknowledgement that there's an area you know a lot about, but there are areas you know less well about. Now, the third one is the difficult one. The reality of budget cuts, the impact on direct services, reductions on local authority funding, ability to fund other parts of the economy, um, and at the same time, members wanting to hear that services are improving, that people are not being disadvantaged, and how people uh, many of you are having to explain the realities in ways that are not going to be antagonistic and counterproductive, but are also honest about the impact of service changes when the reality is budget reductions mean less service and less quality.